Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webcast, The Subversive Six, Hidden Risk Points in Your ICS. I'm Kate Carson, Marketing Events Specialist at Tripwire, and I'm excited to be a part of the webcast today. Before we start, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, make sure that your audio is streaming correctly. Please note that the audio portion will stream through your PC or laptop speakers. Be sure to, uh, to check your speaker volume, the volume setting on your computer and your headset to ensure that it's turned on and volume is at an audible level. Today's presentations will be using a slide deck. You can click on the expand rectangle on the top corner, the top right corner of the slide area to enlarge. If you're not seeing the slide movement in your console, you can try refreshing your browser. If you're experiencing any te technical difficulties, please click on the help widget. It's the question mark icon on your console and it covers most common technical issues. If you have a question for our presenters, click on the Q&A widget and submit your question. At the end of the presentation today, we will have a Q&A session. So feel free to submit comments and uh, other questions during the presentation. Lastly, I'll be sending out a follow-up email with the link to the on-demand webcast and the slide deck. So now let's get on with the presentation. Our presenters today are David Meltzer of Tripwire, Sean McBride of FireEye EyeSight, and Eric Schweigert of Tofino Security Belden. So now, without further delay, I'm going to send it over to David Meltzer. Take it away, David. Thanks, Kate, and good afternoon, everyone. This is Dave Meltzer, Chief Technology Officer at Tripwire. And today we're going to talk about risks in industrial control environments. I'm, I'm going to start out and give you a little bit of background of where are we seeing some of the attacks and some of the threats in these ICS environments today. Then we're going to hear from Sean go through what uh, he called the subversive six, uh, and we'll get into details of that. And, and then we'll hear from Eric, um, who along the way will talk about some of the things we can do to address these challenges. So, so let's start here with where we're seeing the attacks. And here's some data from ICS CERT. Uh, they're going to be updating this with 2016 data very soon. But we've seen, often we talk about industrial as uh, an overall market, but attacks and the kind of threats they face and even the vulnerabilities we see often do target specific verticals within the industrial control environment. And two areas that we've particularly seen uh, targeted for attacks, but also by security researchers for vulnerability disclosure over the last couple of years have been the energy market, which would include utilities uh, as well as nuclear, um, as well as critical manufacturing. Um, by count of incident response from ICS CERT, those make up uh, between the two areas more than half of all of the incidents that they are responding to uh, over, those, uh, over that time period. One of the interesting things that we've seen in the industrial control environment is a much bigger percentage of vulnerabilities that have been published without fixes available at the time that they're published. Uh, and this is something that in the IT side, we did see happen uh, earlier on in the security uh, evolution for IT, where researchers were publishing vulnerabilities and, and the vendors were behind the curve uh, in actually developing the fixes for them. Uh, we actually saw that shift over uh, the course of years where responsible disclosure um, was much more prominent, where established researchers worked with the vendors more closely, uh, and the vendors were getting quicker about actually establishing the remediation. Uh, so we have seen that in IT a little bit different. Not that we don't see uh, vulnerabilities come out. You've seen in the news even recently everything from uh, WikiLeaks zero days that have been disclosed to uh, even Google has done some of those disclosures. Um, but it, it's definitely not as prominent as we've seen from the statistical information on the ICS side. So this, you know, this means that you know we we are at risk in many of these industrial environments because of you know, this level of, one, vulnerabilities that exist that have not yet been found, but even when they are found, sometimes either no fix is available, but then the bigger problem, and you'll hear Sean talk a little bit about this more, is even when the fixes are available, actually getting those systems upgraded, uh, patched, or mediated sometimes can be challenging. And, and that leads to what you'll hear Eric talk a little bit more about, which is sometimes if we can't patch a system, we need to figure out well, what's that mitigating control What's that compensating way that we could 
keep a system from being exploited even if we couldn't necessarily update the system itself. When we talk about vulnerabilities um, in the industrial environment, um, those of you who've worked in industrial systems for a while are probably familiar with the Purdue model. Um, on the IT side, that might be something that's a little bit of a new concept. Um, but the Purdue model is a way of looking at the different layers of a network, starting from everything, the sensors and actuators, which are the things that are actually interacting with your physical environment moving up that stack to things like your PLCs and your RTUs, the systems that are controlling and getting information out of and pushing uh, control system information to your sensors, your actuator, your motors. Uh, and then you move up that, I, you know, that stack of information all the way up to what would be your traditional IT systems. And so we look at threats and we look at the threat environment in terms of you know, where are we seeing vulnerabilities at these different layers of the Purdue model. Um, and it's interesting because the, the data that we see is maybe a little bit um, counterintuitive, uh, I would say. Um, very often we talk about industrial control security, and you hear people very focused on the physical devices, uh, the sensors or the PLCs themselves. Well, the, the research that we have suggests that the most likely system to be exploited uh, in an industrial environment is actually a Windows PC. Um, because that's where known exploits exist. There's lots of publicly available tools out there to go break into those systems, um, and there's lots of vulnerabilities. And in industrial environments, sometimes you don't even realize where do all these Windows systems live. Sometimes it's exhibiting itself as a, an HMI, a human-machine interface, but it might be running an embedded version of Windows on the back end of that system. Uh, and so you work your way up that stack and, and get all the way to your standard IT systems, which we know, you know, the vulnerability state and have been dealing with that for a long time. So if we actually then go look at the numbers uh, and some of the statistics we have around this, uh, what we've seen is that that zone two, um, those which tend to be standard systems around uh, HMIs, operator workstations, historians, um, that's actually where you have the highest level of vulnerability. Um, that's sitting in most of the environment. So you want to, you know, we want to kind of look at, well, where are the vulnerabilities in that system? Not that we haven't seen vulnerabilities that exist, and sometimes it's the most interesting things that we see when people are directly attacking a programmable logic controller. And from a, a safety and availability perspective, we are particularly concerned about risks and attacks and vulnerabilities that target the physical systems. Um, but often there becomes, a, in an attack cycle, there becomes a pivot point where someone's going to start at the Windows system, start at that easy-to-exploit system or something that's more directly connected uh, to the IT network or Internet-bound systems and use that as the pivot point to then get into the physical systems, which may have a, a, an overall actually lower level of risk than some of those Zone 2 systems that exist in the environment. Um, the other comment I'll make on some of the statistics are, you know, you see a low number of industrial-specific vulnerabilities up at Zone 5. Uh, there are plenty of IT standard vulnerabilities that exist in your standard IT systems. So, you know, that, that could become the jumping off point from everything as simple as a phishing attack to start with, which then pivots to get into an operator workstation in the industrial network, which then pivots to exploit a PLC vulnerability. So these are all interrelated systems that we, that we think about. So with that, um, I'd like to take a quick poll of the audience here. Uh, and you can just uh, check one of these boxes and click Submit. And we'll spend about 10 seconds just getting this poll uh, so we can get a little information of uh, what's your current skill set as it relates to ICS security. Um, so I'll give everyone a few seconds to uh, pick something on there. And then uh, I'll advance the results here in about five seconds. Great. Well, let's see the results. Um, actually, uh, quite a mix here. So, um, you know, actually a majority of people who have either a knowledgeable or some working knowledge, uh, a few people who are on that beginner stage, and uh, a few of the experts. You probably, uh, you could probably give this webcast uh, with, uh, with Sean and Eric the next time if you'd like. So, uh, good results. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Sean McBride, who's, who's going to dig into some of this subversive six for us. Fantastic. Um, thank you, David. So essentially, um, I, I want to give a little bit, a little bit of background on where the Subversive 
six came from. Now, I've been watching the threat environment to industrial control systems for uh, quite a while. Um, uh, my first job after I graduated from uh, from the NSA NSF Cyber Corps program uh, was at the Idaho National Laboratory. And there I was assigned to what back in those days was called the Control Systems Situational Awareness Effort. Really, we, we proposed this effort to the DHS, and it involved watching um, a wide variety of sources uh, on the Internet, mailing lists, et cetera, for indications of uh, both researcher and adversarial interest in um, capability to uh, attack industrial control systems. So, so I've watched it for, for quite a while. Um, like I said, is, is in addition to standing up kind of those periodic reports that are now known as the ICS CERT Monitor, also was instrumental in standing up the vulnerability analysis uh, portion of the ICS CERT, which you may consume as uh, ICS CERT advisories or alerts today. And some of those statistics that David ran through earlier about vulnerabilities came from reports that FireEye published um, last year. So you can come out to the FireEye website and, and get that full report if you'd like. But so there's a little a bit about my background. And so because I follow the threat environment closely, sometimes I get invited to go do um, to go talk to different groups about threats, et cetera. And uh, a couple of years ago, one of the leading kind of pure play ICS integration firms in North America invited me to come out and talk to what amounted to their customer advisory board. So a relatively small group of people, uh, probably 20 invitees, and they covered a variety of industries. So we had some from the Northwest, where we got some great, you know, these guys are running dairies and creameries. And we've got some Midwest refinery operators and some, uh, some electricity um, utilities as well. So a really good mix of people. And in the afternoon of day one, it was my turn to talk about the threat environment. And I thought I gave a great presentation. I had some breakout groups after that. Well, the next morning, um, we all get together again for day two, and the CEO of this firm asked the attendees what they thought of, of day one and kind of for some feedback. And everyone was pretty happy except for this one fellow who had been in SCADA and control systems for a long time uh, operating refineries. And he told the CEO, he said, everything was great about yesterday except for the cybersecurity presentation. And, you know, my heart is like falling to the, to the floor uh, when he says this. And, you know, I realized that for some reason I had not hit the mark with this uh, individual. He said, hey, look, we've been operating refineries great for 30 years, um, and the problem is that when security starts coming in there, we're afraid it's going to shut down our process or interrupt the reliability of our plant. And I realized then that I needed a message that was going to resound with both the SCADA operators, right, who say, hey, the Modbus, Modbus protocol served us great, um, as well as with the decision makers when it comes to security. So that's the you know, CISO types, CSO types, um, and even up to the CEO on a board level. So the idea behind Subversive 6 was to come up with a kind of catchy and creative concept, uh, Subversive 6, to spur a conversation in enterprises about the core technological weaknesses of industrial environments. So I want to set that background uh, for you as we began here. I also like to emphasize that we're talking about control systems. We're not talking about information. You know that, right? We're talking about serious consequences. And so one of the examples that I like to point out, and this was not a you know, premeditated cyber attack, but nevertheless, um, it, there's an important cyber element, which was the explosion in San Bruno, California in 2010. What happened here is you have some uh, control technicians that are going out to the Miltitas um, compressor, uh, not compressor, but um, natural gas terminal, and they're going to change out, they're changing out their power supplies, and they're going to hook on these UPSs. And so they're trying to de-energize um, the old power supplies and hook up these UPSs. And so they're coordinating with the SCADA uh, control center um, for PG&E. And essentially, they say, okay, we're going to do the switchover. Um, they turn it to man you know, manual local control. So the SCADA operators can't see what's going on. It's about 15 minutes or so they can't see what's going on. They power the thing back up, and everything looks fine. So then they de-energize the breaker because they think that the power is all coming from somewhere else, and they lose local visibility. Okay, now in that moment, instead of re-energizing the breaker, they spent some time trying to troubleshoot um, why that breaker was still, where that breaker was still providing electricity to. And so um, the report isn't exactly clear, but somehow some uh, voltages caused uh, two types of valves to fail. One is the, the actual control valve, and the other is uh, the, the positioning. Um, uh, there's a secondary safety valve there. 
And so the folks at the Milpitas terminal believe that all the valves except for one are closed, and that's false. The valves are open. And some other, uh, they, again, uh, in the um, National Transportation Safety Board report, also say that those secondary valves also believe that those uh, valves, that the safety valves are in a different, the regulator valves are in a different position. And so as a result, all the valves are open. And the, the, the line from this report is that we've overpressurized the entire peninsula. And so as a result, we're, we're near, right, maximal allowable operating pressure. You've got weak wells downstream and, uh, you know, pipeline pops spark and you've got a massive fireball of explosion that lasts for hours. So the idea here, right, is that there are many factors going into that. But at the end of the day, it's a loss of visibility and, indeed, an inability to, to, to control or know what's going on on your network. I mean, can you imagine if this had been, you know, an adversary intentionally sending false data uh, to the controllers or from the controllers to the SCADA? Um, so that's the concept that I want to get across here is that real problems exist on these networks that need to be uh, addressed. So we've called this Subversive 6. And here, um, here they are. Outdated hardware, vulnerable Windows operating systems, weak password management, weak file integrity checks, unauthenticated protocols, and undocumented third-party relationships. So as you socialize the concept of security within your organization, these are six concepts that you can sit down and start to say, hey, here's what these things mean. Here's our definitions. Here's cases, whether in research or real life, when adversaries uh, or, you know, researchers have found problems that need to be addressed and start to talk uh, through these, these core issues. All right, so number one, outdated hardware. Well, what do I mean by talking about outdated hardware, okay? Um, we're talking about things that are really old. Now, in your plants, lots of old things exist, but many times we don't take time to process what that means for the reliability of that control network. So here's two, right? When you download this paper, and we're going to make sure that everyone gets the, the email to download this paper um, from the FireEye website. Um, but there are several examples that we give of each of these. And I'm just going to call out two here. The first is that um, the nuclear regulatory, the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission relates that in August 2006, right, over 10 years ago, PLCs and variable frequency drives of Browns Ferry malfunctioned as a result of what they termed excessive network traffic. So in, in today's world where we have modern processors, like those numbers of um, you know, how many packets per second can your equipment process have, have really increased over time. And uh, Eric's going to chime in here in a minute uh, about some ways you can deal with that. The second is that digital bond, so as you know, relatively well-known um, consultancy, they like to point to this GE D20 substation automation gateway, uh, which is still sold today, has the same processor from a you know, the same processor, generation processor uh, used in the um, Mac OS2. Um, so, so that's the idea of look at how old these systems are and even moving on with upgrades. Um, I mean, not necessarily moving on with upgrades, we need to be thinking about um, upgrade strategies and ways to mitigate the amount of traffic on those networks. All right, so number two, vulnerabilities in the Windows operating systems. Um, David mentioned this at the beginning, and it's important to realize that just because Windows no longer supports your operating system, the vulnerabilities and even exploits don't exist. So one of the things that FireEye does is we have researchers essentially all, all over the globe in underground forums, et cetera, and we're trying to watch for what vulnerabilities are being exploited in the wild. And in 2015, we saw numerous exploit kits. So new, an exploit kit is different from, like, some people might think of Metasploit. No, it's not an exploit kit. An exploit kit is a piece of code that gets loaded on a website that when you visit that website, it will scan your system and try to identify what, um, what operating system are you running, what browser are you running, et cetera, and serve up an exploit that, that takes advantage of those weaknesses based on what you're running. So numerous exploit kits have exploits in there that are targeting uh, unsupported operating systems. Um, okay, so Windows 7, right, some people think that uh, there might be uh, – let me go back. There's lots of vulnerabilities from earlier generations of Microsoft code that also affect Windows 7. And you've got these same vulnerabilities that also affect, even though it's not on the Microsoft Advisory anymore, because it's an unsupported product, but also affects Windows XP. All right. Um, the final point on here is a publicly available exploit code exists for at least eight vulnerabilities in Windows Server OS as well. So not only the uh, workstations, but also the servers are important to keep in mind. And that, and Sean, that, 
that existence of embedded windows is really prevalent in, in, in many industrial environments. So knowing where those vulnerabilities exist is really something important uh, to get a handle on, um, even, even when it might not be clear that you even have windows, uh, it may exist there. I think that's a fantastic point. You know, if you go back to those advisories, um, you will find that, um, that many of them also affect those embedded versions, but you're not thinking about that at the time you're looking at the advisory. Or better said, are your patching people, do they recognize that you're running those embedded versions on your plant side? Um, those are really good points. Thank you, David. Okay, so I want to go back. You know, I skipped I skipped forward a little bit too much here. Through, do you want to do you want to dive into the? Do you want to answer this, uh, Eric? Go, I realized that yeah. I, I called you out and didn't give you a chance to to speak. <laughs> no problem. Um, so yeah, I mean the the outdated hardware. You know, this is prevalent sort of in the ICS landscape. You know, there's tons of brownfield installs out there, and in many cases, you know, you don't have the plan downtime to be replacing or maybe the cost is just prohibitive. So, um, you know, a method to protect these legacy devices is to install, you know, some firewall technology in front of, the, in front of that device itself. Um, in addition, so the cost of replacing the outdated hardware may actually be more than the cost of adding a firewall device. Uh, and what we found is, you know, people with these sort of legacy installs, you know, they, they realize they can't, they can't update, you know, for whatever reason. Um, once they put this firewall uh, in front of these PLCs that sometimes they'll see, you know, there's a lot of network traffic reaching the PLC that they had no idea. So, you know, by adding an additional firewall device to their network, they're not only protecting the PLC itself, but they're also, you know, realizing, you know, there's a lot of network traffic that, you know, reaching areas where they had no idea. So, yeah, you had mentioned to me on a previous occasion that um, some of those firewalls, uh, and I'm sure I'm thinking of the Tofino, right, can, can handle more network traffic um, than, than the original device can. Exactly. So you have the ability to rate limit traffic. You know, you can alarm. So you're seeing that, oh, wow, you know, the office network is now reaching my PLC. Well, that, that's not the best, uh, the best thing. So, you know, there's a lot of advantages to, to adding, you know, DPAC inspection or just general you know, firewalling technology, such as the Tofino, uh, in front of these old legacy PLCs. Yeah, very cool. You know, and, and the robustness testing uh, standards, um, obviously, you know, the amount of traffic that your devices can handle are an important consideration um, as well. Thank you. Okay, so we went to operating systems. Now we're looking at weak password management. Okay, so, you know, most of the time, we're talking about passwords, you're thinking, um, you know, passwords seem to be so important in today's world. I personally have like several hundred passwords that I've got to keep track of. And I use a password management tool um, to do that because there's simply no way that I can keep all those passwords um, separate and remember them in my mind in a, in a secure or more secure way. And and so when you go to, I mean, so let's look at the you know the Yahoo password breach for example, right? If your information is in those, then and you're reusing a password, then it may be relatively trivial for someone to take a look at that, find out where else you have accounts, and try those passwords and gain access. So we know in, the, in control environments, very similar situation exists where sometimes you've got users using similar passwords, uh, you know, multiple users using the same password, and there are requirements for that, right? You can't. You can't have not have someone accessing uh, the HMI or doing troubleshooting. What you know, one other problem on the network has got to be accessible. And so we recognize that there are challenges to the passwords in OT environments that don't necessarily exist in IT environments. But what you may not realize is that lots of times those vendor default passwords are easily accessible online, right? Just because um, <laughs> you didn't change it doesn't mean that no one knows what it is. So there's a group of researchers that actively maintain publicly available lists of hard code or default passwords. And one of those examples there, State of Strange Love, you can see it on the right, uh, State of Pass, was their effort, and they're not the only ones doing this, to go out and accumulate all the default and hard coded passwords that they can. Now, there are actually others who have, and this was based on some, some uh, Shodan uh, functionality, who have actually gone out there and said, okay, we're going to create this list of default passwords, and then we're going to scan Shodan for these devices, and then we're going to write a, uh, a piece of code that tries all the, um, is a, you know, simply a, kind, of a, kind of a botnet of sorts, that tries to log in using the default um, password. 
And so recognize that people are out there thinking through uh, how to do this type of thing. Um, in addition, when you look at this from the security research perspective, lots of research, if you go to those you know, thousands, whatever it is, 1,500 vulnerabilities um, that we've looked at over the past 15 years in control environments, lots of those deal with passwords, uh, password issues, password management, right? Some of these, <laughs> I'll just point this out because it's rather funny. Some of the software uh, where you've got a client um, will actually validate the password on the client side. Um, which is, is mind-boggling that you would put something like a password in place and then validate it on your site. Uh, we'll get to, to some of the more the trickier issues around um, around un unauthenticated protocols in a second here. But anything that David um, uh, you'd like to add on the password issue? Well, I did just uh, obviously change from the hard code, but um, you also could look at automated tools that could help you look at, um, you know, do, do you have any of these hard-coded passwords and what are your passwords? More broadly, what's your password policies? Um, so look, look for those kind of things. I, I think that's important. Eric, do you want to add something? No, I think that's really hitting the nail on the head. You know, there needs to be some sort of policy or, you know, a mechanism, a sort of a check valve to, to really be validating uh, the correctness of passwords or the strength of passwords. Yeah. Right, password strength. So, um, anyways, I think there's more to say there, but it's just I think it's worth taking your time to identify what default passwords are you using today, what hard coded passwords exist in those devices that you have today. It's going to take a little bit of investigation, but I think it's well worth um, your time. And then, of course, network security monitoring can can tell you um, anytime you see one of those the default passwords or you know passwords going across the uh, the network. All right, um, we're on now to weak file integrity checks. Now, um, I know most of you said you had some familiarity, but I think it's important to kind of define what we're talking about when, when we mean integrity. So normally, when we're talking about integrity checks, uh, we're talking about some cryptographic verification that the software comes from an authorized source. So a vendor will normally generate their own certificate or rely on a certificate authority to allow the client to verify um, the source of that software. But a lack of software signing allows attackers to mislead users into installing software that did not originate from the vendor. Also allows attackers to replace legitimate files with malicious ones. Okay? Now that sounds kind of uh, you know, hard to believe, but it's absolutely um, the case. Here's, here's a couple of examples. So, in March of last year, these researchers say, hey, we're just going to use the Siemens uh, protocol to, um, to change the control logic on these devices, right? So if, you're, if your firmware were signed um, sufficiently, and I know that you know, some later generations of, of PLCs can handle this, but in general, there's no way to check where that's coming from, right? I send you the, the firmware, I send you the control logic, and you're going to accept it. Um, uh, same with un unmodified, uh, unauthorized firmware modifications. I have an example here, but there's there's a more salient one that I even like more, which is in the 2015 Ukraine power outage attacks. You have these, um, they're a Russian brand of protocol converters, so uh, serial to TCP protocol converters, and the attackers pushed bad firmware to the devices and bricked them. So um, while they'd already shut off the power another, you know, another way, that delayed the ability of the uh, utility to bring power back up and get visibility to the field. So this technique of pushing bad firmware, um, you know, it's, it's been known for a long time, and it's been used in, uh, in the wild. And then finally, uh, if you look back historically, they're starting in 2009, DHS even issued a FOUO alert saying, hey, we're aware that you can modify firmware and, and brick devices. So historically, right, from 2009 to 2015, six years it took to go from, you know, research uh, re that people have done in the United States to this attack being exploited in the wild. What can you say, um, there, uh, David, about um, mitigation for yeah, and, weak and, and, and clearly the, the And clearly the idea of knowing, you know, what, did something change in your environment is really a precursor to knowing did someone do something malicious. If you don't have that visibility to what's going on and is something changing, um, then you know you, you could have breaches and incidents and, and you're completely blind to that. 
Uh, but you, you made another comment, which I, I thought was really interesting, around the protocol converters. You know, we, we, a lot of these devices sit in the industrial environment. We think of them as serial devices, but people are picking up and deploying these serial to IP converters all over the place in industrial environments. And, and these devices are getting connected in, and they have IP addresses. And if, if, you're not, if you're not getting the visibility to what's actually connected to your network now, there may be a lot more things than you think. Great. Eric, anything you want to add? No, I think that's uh, that's a great point. Okay, I was, I'll add just a couple things here. One is there are several vendors out there today that um, that give you good visibility into your control networks, and so I think it's worthwhile taking the time to check them out and recognize that hey, on the IT network, there's software um, that that can do deep packet inspection and send alerts and all sorts of things um, that's been around for a long, long time. And that same visibility just doesn't exist in many OT networks. And so I think it's, that's the solution that you want to keep in mind uh, as kind of a, an alert, um, you know, detect approach as opposed to uh, or in conjunction with a prevent approach. One of the interesting, um, one more kind of anecdote here that I think is, is fascinating is you, these guys, from this, it was at this time, Israeli from the U.S. firm, um, they modified the logic on a PLC to add a debugger to the firmware. And that way they can actually fuzz the device for vulnerabilities, and then they disclose the vulnerabilities. So you've got researchers also doing this kind of fascinating, oh, we'll manipulate this device to make it serve our, our needs to find more vulnerabilities. Um, so it really is uh, an interesting issue. Okay. In my mind, we're getting right to the core of some of the technological challenges that separate IT and OT networks. Um, and here we're at unauthenticated protocols. So when I talk about authentication, right, we talked a minute ago about uh, kind of integrity, which is the ability to, to determine where something, uh, kind of where something came from and hasn't been changed. And here you've got uh, unauthenticated protocols. And so authentication normally means, right, um, uh, uh, excuse me, it means the ability to say, hey, I know that this device sent this packet, right? There's some, again, cryptographic verification. And in the industrial control world, you've got protocols, and I've listed a couple here, right? On, on layer zero to one, so again, between your sensors and actuators and your controllers, you've got our foundation field bus, profit bus, uh, control area network that are unauthenticated, which means that, look, if I can stick, if I can literally flip a wire and stick some sort of tap in between there, I can manipulate the, the data that's going between and no one's ever going to know because there's nothing built into the protocol to detect that. Right? Similar thing can be said between layers one and two generally with your Modbus, TCP, DMV3, Ethernet, IP. Same thing, right? No one can tell whether that command was authorized or not. And even if you are monitoring, like I mentioned it before, now you've got an alert that you've got to look into, but the protocol by nature does not stop anyone from updating the logic or from changing a set point. So when you talk about, I mean, I think this point is absolutely pivotal to get across to, you know, the people at your board level or your CSO who's never looked at the plant environment before. Um, one example here, again, uh, is the Metasploit modules modicon command, uh, remote start stop. There are several of these Metasploit modules. What, what is that? It's an exploit tool that, that means that just about anyone who has access to this network with this tool, if you're using a Modbus network with Schneider devices, can turn your, uh, uh, your PLCs on or off. Okay, um, let's yeah. talk about mitigations. David, chime in. So Eric, I think well, this applies pretty directly to your casino, so why don't, why don't you take this one? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, so what it comes down to is really we need the ability to inspect these Modbus or Ethernet IP, you know, DNP3 messages for the actual content itself and only really permit the specific actions toward that PLC. So in the case of, you know, the metal exploit module, we want to utilize the packet inspection to block the right commands embedded in the function code 90, you know, as an example. So this means that our DPAC inspection, obviously, it needs to understand what function code 90 is. And this is really, in this case, this is really vendor-specific um, to Schneider. So in the case of the Tavino, we can actually um, look at these function code 90 messages, um, this unity mechanism that Schneider has. So... I mean, so this is sort of one example. It's not limited to Modbus. You know, common ICS protocols also have commands that, that allow you to update firmware. You know, you can read diagnostics data, stop running processes, all within the same communication stream that is being used to also, you know, get your HMI station pressure data, that kind of thing. So in lieu of 
having authentication, um, you really can use deep packet inspection to differentiate between your write commands, your read commands, um, and this will help you, you know, sort of get around the shortcomings of these legacy protocols. Fantastic. So if I were in charge here, right, of, of my plant security, the first thing I would do was I would do a survey to determine, okay, what are all the unauthenticated protocols that I'm using, okay? Um, that gives me an ability to start to understand where vulnerabilities would lie if someone were to get access um, somewhere on my, my plant network. Then I want to find out, okay, of those locations, which, which equipment can support um, some authenticated option? Um, there are, like for DNP3, there is a SA, a secure authentication um, option now. Other vendors are also working on authentication um, options for their protocols. So I think that's worth keeping in mind, especially as a longer term solution. Um, you, you also need to look potentially, and there's some papers out there that do this, but look at latency that would be uh, implemented by if you want to go with a bump in the wire solution. And maybe that, that doesn't work for every plan or might not be necessary, but I think it's worth considering, well, what happens if someone is at this place? And if I've got a highly critical process where the safety of my employees or indeed the surrounding environment or uh, the public safety is in place, then it might be worth considering um, some bump in the wire solution. Okay, you know, and, and right, generally you can also do similar things with, um, you can take some preventative steps with uh, restrictive access control lists and firewall rules. Okay. So moving on to this, this one is, is kind of a, it really is a hidden um, challenge, which is undocumented third party relationships. So what does that mean? Well, that means that we have to look at this challenge as not only being about the operator at the, at the plant floor level. It, there's really the vendor that comes into place. We talked about vulnerabilities to start off. There's of course the operator, but, and, and, and I mentioned of course the system integrators as well. But the firm that's making the software or creating the device that you're going to use, it's difficult sometimes to understand what practices are they using, how much security is in on their uh, approach, their security lifecycle, for example. And third-party relationships often are kind of a hidden gotcha. So, um, so what do I mean by that? Well, I mean, let's just say, for example, that I have a, a software product and I'm going to use some open source um, product and incorporate that into mine. So let's say OpenSSL, for example, probably a very common one. But we know from the Heartwood vulnerabilities that, that affected a whole bunch of vendors because they were using that open source software. Did you know? Do you know what third-party software your vendor uses? Does your vendor disclose that to you? I think those are important questions to, uh, to ask. Now, you've got this group of Russian security researchers known as SCADA, Strangelove, and some of them, you know, they, they, don't, they have a kind of a diverse background, doesn't just represent one company. But starting in about 2013, they kind of went to town looking very closely at a broad variety of industrial control systems, from train control to Siemens controllers, and they disclosed, they, they claim to have found over 500 vulnerabilities. They disclosed well over 100 of those publicly. And one of the things that they did is they looked through Siemens WinCC and tried to identify all the third-party software dependencies that are in there. And uh, they said there are at least 15 third-party products in Siemens WinCC. And uh, if you add up all the vulnerabilities total in that product, you've got 1,800 vulnerabilities, um, one of which was disclosed in 1997. So looking back, and I don't mean to, you know, Siemens has actually done a fantastic job in recent years of um, taking security very seriously, so I don't mean to just single them out. But they're a fantastic example of, oh, wait a minute, right? I'm an operator. Yeah, I've got these problems. But also, I've got to deal with, um, I've got to get my vendor to up their game as well. Um, okay, I've, I'll run through both the examples on the slide. David, what can you say about this? Um, well, I think I think you covered it really well. Why don't we uh, Why don't we get to the next poll? Okay, let's turn it over to the next poll. So, where do you fall organizationally? Um, this is a good. You know, I'll give you a few seconds to answer here. But it's important that, that you understand uh, where you fall to understand who you've got to work with to address these issues and couch them in the terms that they um, are ready to to use and discuss. So I'll give you a couple more seconds here. Three, two, one, on to the next one. Okay. 
40 percent within the IT. Fantastic. I'm really glad uh, to see that. I hope that the discussion here has been enlightening. Consulting and vendors uh, as well at 30 percent. All right. Um, we'll hand it over to Eric. Okay, thanks, Sean. So uh, to understand DPAC inspection, we first need to understand what a standard stateful firewall does and how DPAC inspection firewall builds upon that technology. So in the case of a standard stateful firewall, the filter mechanism will key in on specific fields within the header uh, information of a packet. So in the example shown here, it would inspect the IP source, destination field, as well as some of the port information, you know, such as UDP or TCP and what the actual port is. Um, so that's about the extent in which you would filter. So, I mean, this means, for example, if you decided to permit, you know, HTTP traffic, you know, port 80, then the firewall would first look at the IP pair, then it would check that the port is actually 80, and then after that it would uh, not decode the HTTP message to see, you know, if the TCP payload is actually an HTTP message. So you could, you know, just create some TCP payload that's filled with apps, you know, 1,200 bytes worth, and the standard stateful firewall it would be none the wiser and just really let that traffic go through. So this is this is a dangerous thought because you could certainly piggyback information this way and use it as a mechanism to exfiltrate data. So in the case of a DPI firewall or DPAC inspection firewall, uh, it goes to the next field and will actually validate that protocol information. So let's take Modbus, for example. In the same way that the stateful firewall uh, is validating IP source and destination port information. Uh, the DPI firewall will, will still do this, um, but in addition, it'll actually look at the, you know, for mod, in the Modbus case, the, the MB app header to ensure that those fields are accurate, and then it will continue to look at the specific uh, Modbus function codes uh, that are being used. So what this means is it, it gives you the ability to permit, you know, only read Modbus function codes, and you could really drop all, all write function codes. So this is a powerful tool, and it gives you the ability to really fine grain what actions are allowed to reach the PLC. So this ensures that for those unauthenticated protocols, you know, like some of the ones we talked about earlier, you know, the Modbus, Ethernet IP, DMP3, we can provide, you know, a mechanism to really differentiate between those those type of uh, those type of actions. So this really comes to um, I'm trying to live slide here. So some sort of DPI terms. So these are really used in the, in the ICS world. So that's the data plane and the control plane. So the data plane are all your standard data functions that a PLC would do. It's really a ladder logic that's programmed to run on that PLC itself. So it would be monitoring a pressure valve or ensuring that a pump is closed. You could think of it kind of like your web browser running on Windows. The web browser is running on top of your operating system. It doesn't really affect the underlying you know, system. So this data plane process typically transmits data, you know, over Modbus, Ethernet IP, DNP3. The control plane, on the other hand, are really the mechanisms that allow the user to update the underlying firmware. So think of a Windows update. This modifies the underlying OS, but uh, it shouldn't really affect your web browser. You know, it should still run fine after the update. So, for example, if you move the, mer the version of Control Logics, you know, in your PLC to the next version, that's really your control plane action. So the ability to update the control plane is unfortunately accessible by the same stream as the data plane. So there's no really differentiation, and in many cases there's no authentic authentication. So if you can, you know, do a Modbus read, you could also do sort of a Modbus, um, you know, update, or you could write to specific registers and really cause some some unfortunate things to happen to your network if you're not protecting it uh, correctly. So if we think about, you know, different mechanisms for um, providing DPAC inspection, um, you know, signatures are, are sort of one way of doing it, but, you know, it's, in my mind, it's not really the, the best way. So, you know, you can think of it as sort of your antivirus software. So on the daily, you'll be getting these new updates that, that provided by your favorite uh, antivirus company. So a new signature has been downloaded to mitigate some published vulnerability. But think about that for a second. You know, a published vulnerability, or at least known by the AV company, this means that this is really a, a reactive process. So to build a mitigation, the vulnerability has to already be known. So this means it's already out in the wild. Um, so it could have, you know, already affected your system. So a more uh, proactive approach is needed. Uh, your PLC and plan operation should not have an internet connection, uh, internet connection in the first place. So how would you even go about updating your signature database in the first place? So in, with signatures, you're really building a blacklist. So this means that you have no guarantee that you've covered every possible vulnerability or permutation. And in fact, if you do receive a new signature that does a direct pattern match, what happens if the vulnerability mutates? So perhaps an additional byte is added, 
you know, now that signature is no longer effective and you have to update the signature set again. You know, this is kind of a rinse and repeat thing. So a whitelist approach is far more effective. It's far better to only open up a really small hole for specific traffic or specific packet types to reach the PLC. So this is where a full protocol implementation is really needed. It does, that does not require signatures or updates because it's, it's programmed, you know, from the get-go, learning the, the actual protocol specification, understanding the specific packet types. So that's kind of the benefit of, you know, a full protocol implementation. So in general, you know, the depth of validation matters more than the breadth of it. So, you know, if someone's stating, oh, we support 500 protocols, but the validation really only critiques one byte in that packet, it's not very useful. It's kind of like saying, yeah, we have a seatbelt in our car, but it'll only hold you in your seat on impacts up to 20 miles per hour. It's not very useful at all. That seatbelt really covers only slow-moving accidents, which in general is probably, you know, 5% of accidents. And in that accident, you know, you wouldn't really be hurt without a seatbelt anyways. So the same can really be said for signature-based mechanism. It covers that 5%, but all the harmful attacks, you know, would just, would just kind of go through. So this is where, you know, the Tofino product comes in. So this, so I manage the Tofino security uh, engineering team. And we've, you know, I've been with uh, Tofino since 2007, um, and we've been a part of uh, Belden since 2011. So it's really, its core competency is to protect your critical infrastructure. And it was built with security in mind during the entire development process. So it's not like we were in the, you know, enterprise IT world. We started in the IT world, or sorry, in the ICS world, and, you know, we re remain there. Um, so it's got some sort of interesting benefits, and one of which is that it doesn't have an IP address. So you don't have to allocate new, I new IPs on your network. You know, it's meant to sit right in front of the PLC. And I think that the cool thing that we do is, is our DPAC inspection of these industrial protocols. So it gives you that ability to you know, differentiate between those control plane mechanisms and the data plane. So you can really say, you know, I only want read messages coming back. I'll, I'll drop any write. So if there's some, you know, inadvertent change in your network or someone actually gains access to your network, you, know, you can be assured that you know, someone's not going to update the firmware or, or try to exfiltrate data. It can also be used to um, help you protect uh, or add network segmentation. You know, that's the IEC 62443 um, standard, so that's using the whole defense in depth mechanism. So um, I think I'll push it to the next slide here uh, for David. Great. Thanks, Eric and Sean, for that update. Belden, Tripwire, and FireEye have been working together to help address security solutions in the industrial space, uh, and we've had a partnership that's going on for several years now. Um, whether you're early on in your industrial security process and you're looking to just get a picture of what is your current state, uh, FireEye with our Mandiant service can help with those uh, initial assessments and give you some recommendations of things that you could do. Or you're at the stage of needing to build a secure industrial network using Belden solutions at either the networking, routing, or with the Tofino industrial firewall level. When you get past that and, and want to start monitoring and actually securing these environments at that system level or that up to the zone two, three, four, five levels, um, that's where Tripwire solutions for monitoring, change auditing, vulnerability management, all the way down to the PLC levels available, as well as FireEye solutions for network monitoring in combined with FireEye's EyeSight threat intelligence specifically focused on the industrial areas. Uh, and finally, FireEye's Mandiant services provide world-class incident response at the back end uh, because we know we can't prevent all breaches and, and sometimes we need to effectively respond to things that do happen in the environment. So hopefully uh, you've learned a little bit about the Subversive 6 and, and gotten a little bit of a view of uh, what are some of the main challenges uh, people are facing in these industrial environments today. Um, certainly uh, look for a, getting a plan together for how you're going to address your ICS security challenges. Uh, look for how can you have that conversation uh, within your organization about the subversive six uh, and look for what are those mitigating controls you're going to put in place to address them, whether it's starting with basic inventory and visibility of what do you have in your environment or you're going to implement some network segmentation and monitoring solutions from places like uh, Tofino, FireEye, or other vendors. Um, you know, there's a variety of things you can do that you could install and deploy into your existing environment to help add that additional layers of security to address these threats that people face. And with that, I think we do have time for probably uh, at least one or two questions. 
So uh, let me start out uh, with this one. Uh, and if you have a question, feel free to submit it uh, in the Q&A box we have. So uh, we talked about this approach of uh, detect versus prevent. Um, can we talk a little bit about what does, what does that difference mean? Uh, and maybe specifically on the Tofino side, is this something that's just preventing attacks, or can I also be watching uh, for what's happening on the network as well? Um, Eric? Yeah, so from the Tofino side, um, we have the ability to um, you know, send syslog messages or, or alarms to you know your SIM in your network, or really to any device where where you could read syslog. So if something were to be external to your your firewall list or your specific VPAC inspection um, that you're doing on a, on a protocol, um, it allows you to you know drop that message, as in we're going to not allow that packet to reach the PLC, and then it'll also alarm so that you have some visibility into your network as to where. You know where where this has happened, and you also can be reassured that you know the packet that that uh, was going to reach the PLC has been been blocked. And, and Sean, anything more on that? You know, detect versus prevent, or, yeah. or how should you be thinking about yeah. this in the industrial environment? Yeah, I think um, uh, Eric did a good job there of describing right. Um, so we know that no one has unlimited resources um, to tackle this issue, especially not uh, today. And so as you sit down and try to plan for what you're going to do in the future, you've got to have some significant, um, some significant um, oh, maybe we, uh, we lost I'm sorry. I didn't, I'm, I'm sorry there. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I am here. I, I think I came back. Right, so exactly. You've got to determine okay. where you're going to spend your resources and recognize that hey, you know, it's one thing for me to go invest and you know buy something or build something and watch everything going across the wire. It's another thing to say, okay, in these facilities, I've got these critical processes. If something's going to you know blow up or I'm going to have an environmental release, then maybe I do want to take a firewall and stick it in front of there, and that way I don't have to worry right so much about okay, now I got an alert, and who's going to who's going to action that alert, and who in the field needs to go and check things out, right? But it's a little simpler to just say, hey, I got this device, it's deployed, and now I can you know rest a little bit more. Uh, uh, assured than than I would have with with no uh, protection in place. Great. Well, I think that's about all the time we have uh, for the webinar. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending, and certainly thank Sean and Eric for all the insight into the in industrial control environment and the Subversive Six. Um, we'll have some follow-up information for those of you who attended. Uh, we appreciate your time today. <laughs>